Okay, so at this time, I would I'm very happy to introduce GSMOL Corporate Counsel Bruce Stanton. Take it away, Bruce. Thank you very much, Anne. Good morning to all of you throughout California. Once again, we're taking advantage of this wonderful technology so that we can uh, all meet together without traveling, which I enjoy very much now in my advanced age. And uh, we are about to get a monsoon up here in Northern California tomorrow. So I think for us, the good news is fire season is gonna be officially over. <clears throat> And now we just have mudslide season. So hopefully uh, fires and mudslides will be abating for us. We've had a pretty difficult summer, obviously, of all of that. So today, um, as we've done on previous town halls, I'm going to introduce a few topics, but I'm going to be pretty brief today because the main um, thing we want to do today is get to questions. And in doing that, hopefully a lot of issues that all of you on the call may have on your minds will be answered even though you might not have actually posed the question. We got a real large number of questions in advance this time that Anne has forwarded to me. Uh, probably got 30 or more and I'm going to review all of those after I make some introductory comments and then we'll open it up for questions from anybody on the line as we uh, wrap up toward the end. Okay. So with that, I thought I would discuss just a couple of the topics quickly. One is the um, park maintenance inspection uh, briefing that occurs every six months at Department of Housing HCD. We just had that yesterday, so I'm gonna make a few remarks about that. Another is some remarks I'm gonna make about uh, AB 2782 that took effect last year regarding the long-term lease exemption. I just uh, finished uh, an hour session this morning with some very nice folks in San Luis Obispo. And um, their questions that they asked, I think, are very relevant for all of us. And so I wanted to review a few things about that. And I also want to review um, AB 861, which is this, what I'm going to call the, the Park Owner Sublease Prohibition Bill, because we got a few questions about that that I can segue right into as I begin to answer questions. So first of all, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, every six months, Department of Housing conducts what is now an online meeting of stakeholders regarding the Mobile Home Park Maintenance Inspection Task Force. And this is the part of HCD that uh, inspects a certain number of mobile home parks and mobile home spaces every year throughout California for health and safety. There was an audit a couple of years ago done of this program and the auditor found that a lot of changes need to happen. And I'm pleased to see that some of those changes have in fact been implemented. And I think um, we can see evidence that the program has been sort of re-energized and reinvigorated and seems to be uh, working a lot better just within the past two years. Each one of these meetings happens, uh, or these meetings happen twice a year. And each one of the meetings uh, produces what's called the member briefing document. And it has a lot of really useful information in it, um, including what I'm about to share briefly, but a lot of other information, bar graphs and charts. It shows all the parks that have been inspected during the previous uh, six months. Um, it shows which parks are under suspension, which ones uh, are still incomplete in terms of inspections. And there's a lot of really useful information, budget information and so forth. The yesterday's briefing, uh, what I noted was that since the audit and since the HCD inspection program has really um, sort of rebooted, they say that 200 parks have now been inspected that had not been inspected in at least 10 years or more. And that's a good thing. There were uh, some questions, very good questions posed during the meeting yesterday about the issue of notice to park residents when their park is being inspected. And the concern, of course, the residents have is that um, if the park's being inspected, that means not only the common areas, but it means my space is also being inspected. And I wanna be there if possible to 
see that happen, answer any questions the inspector might have, or uh, ask any questions that I might have. And there were a number of questions about that. And we're still, I think, going to be developing information about that. And there's going to be some offline meetings with folks about that. But the general thing that um, I think HCD wants to convey, and Matt Weiss may have done some of this on the previous uh, town hall in September, but um, HCD cannot give residents the exact day and time always that the inspection of their space is going to occur. They give parameters. They might say the, the, the project is going to you know, start on this day and end on this day, but they can't tell you, you know, at Tuesday at 3 p.m., we're going to make it to your space because they just don't know how long it's going to take. And in some cases, while they're inspecting, they, the inspector gets called away on some other urgency issue and the whole process stops until they can return to the park where the MPM is occurring. So they do their best to give a, a parameter, but the resident would actually have to just say, I'm gonna stay home all day, you know, if I wanna be here when they come, because I just don't know when they're coming. There were also questions about why residents cannot accompany inspectors when they're walking around the park. And HCD has particular sensitivity about this issue because one of the things that residents complained about when the audit was performed three years ago was the fact that these inspections seemed to be biased. Either the residents were claiming that the inspector was biased in favor of the park owner or the park management was claiming that the inspectors were biased in favor of the residents. And to avoid the charge of bias on either side, the inspectors are declining requests to have people accompany them because if residents are gonna walk around with them, then management gets to walk around or vice versa. And so they'd rather, do, unless they're gonna make an exception and have everybody involved as a group, um, they're gonna say, no, we're gonna do our work and we're not gonna have anybody uh, coming along because we don't want to be seen as being partial to either side. We want to be impartial. So there was a lot of discussion about that. Interesting that between January and June of this year, the most common park violations found in these inspections are lots not identified, live exposed electrical parts, or gas meter issues, like the gas meter is not properly supported. The most common resident violations found between January and June of 2021 are accumulations of garbage, rubbish or combustible materials under or around the home, which is a clear fire hazard, storage cabinet construction, meaning the, the uh, condition of the sheds or the locations of the sheds, usually issues whether or not the shed is located too close to the lot line. And third was faulty weather protection someplace on the home. Of the violations found, uh, there were 4,045 total resident violations. Of those, 2,831 were corrected. So about three quarters of them were corrected. There were 1,556 park violations, 1,226 corrected. So the majority of the park violations were corrected. Another thing that's, I think, um, interesting to note is there has been quite a, um, quite a changeover in personnel at the top of HCD. Um, people that we've been used to seeing or dealing with are no longer there or have retired out. And so Kyle Krause is now the new deputy director of the division. Uh, Mitch Baker has been appointed as assistant deputy director. There are currently 56 uh, DR1 or 2 uh, employees um, that HCD has in the field. And that basically is what we are calling inspectors. There's 56 inspectors and there are seven codes and standards administrators. So that's kind of a thumbnail of some of the information that was provided at the briefing yesterday. These documents are available. I know that they go out to everybody who's um, in the queue um, who receives notice of these. And I know a number of GSMOL um, 
people, representatives have these. So if anybody wanted to get a copy, I'm sure that they could receive that via email pretty quickly. Um, I wanted to mention these bills and the, the conversation I just had with these folks in San Luis Obispo, as I said, I think is really instructive on this issue. There's some confusion about the long-term lease exemption bill, what we call AB 2782, that um, it took effect um, at the beginning of the year. And the thing that we want to remember here is that this bill gets rid of long-term leases being exempt from local rent stabilization. We call that RSO, Rent Stabilization Ordinances. The RSO exemption, which has been in effect for decades, said that any mobile home lease longer than 12 months is exempt from local RSO, meaning the lease rent provisions can charge more rent than what rent ordinances allow. That exemption is going away pursuant to AB 2782 any long-term lease, a new lease, or an extension of a lease, which is signed beginning on February 13th or after, is exempt from, um, is no longer, excuse me, exempt from RSO. And that's February 13th of 2020, okay? That was the date that we published our bill. And so we could only go retroactively back to that date. We couldn't say, leases signed 10 years ago are no longer exempt. That would be interfering with existing contracts. That's unconstitutional. So this bill said that any new lease or extension signed by a resident from February 13th, 2020 forward is no longer exempt from local rent control where you have local rent control. It doesn't say the whole lease is no good, however. So any lease that's still in effect that you, or that you sign after that date, all the other provisions that are not financially related, those are still a contract that's enforceable, meaning arbitration clauses or release of liability or anything else that's in there is still enforceable. So AB 2782 doesn't blow leases up. It simply says they're no longer uh, going to have an exemption from local rent RSO ordinances. I think that's a really important distinction to know about. It doesn't mean either that people can opt out of their leases. It doesn't mean that if you signed a lease five years ago that has a 10-year term, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm now opting out of my lease. You can't do that. Again, any lease signed after February 12th, of 2020 is no longer exempt from local rent ordinances. All leases signed before that date will become, uh, will lose the exemption as of January 1st of 2025. So by 2025, it's not gonna matter how long ago you signed a long-term lease. As of January 1st, 2025, all mobile home leases in California will no longer have an exemption from local rent ordinances based upon the length of their term. So again, it's important to know that um, the financial provisions, the exemption is the only thing changing, but that is obviously a critical, critical part of any rental agreement. The corollary to that is, again, you never have to sign any new agreement if you're an existing homeowner, you don't need a lease or a rental agreement term to continue to live in your home. You're automatically a month to month tenant and pursuant to the mobile home residency law in 798.56, you can only be terminated for seven reasons. Non-payment of rent, violation of rules and regulations after proper notice, a substantial annoyance of other residents, committing certain crimes on the premises, violent crimes, drug or prostitution related on the premises, or um, if there is um, a change of use of the park uh, or, the, or the park is taken by eminent domain. And the last one would be if you have code violations that are cited by Department of Housing that you do not correct. 
other than that, you can never be terminated because an agreement ends. The agreement never ends. In California, it just keeps going. So it's not like an apartment lease. It's not like a commercial office lease. When the term ends, if you stay there, you're holding over and you can be booted out. That's not the case. So the question now is, why would any resident in a rent uh, jurisdiction and an RSO jurisdiction ever sign <laughs> any kind of new lease or uh, or amendment that continues an existing lease. The only reason would be if that document has helpful and beneficial provisions to you. Otherwise, you're covered by your ordinance. Um, you know whether you have something signed or not. So I thought it was important to kind of review that again because. I know that we're still getting a lot of questions and we will continue to, and that's okay. We'll, we'll be able to sort that out. Finally, before I get to the specific questions, and I'm gonna segue into a couple, I wanna talk about AB 861, which was just um, signed into law by the governor to take effect January 1st. And this is the Bennett bill. And this is what we have called for many years, What's good for the goose is good for the gander legislation. It simply says that if the park owner um, does not allow subleasing for the residents, the park owner can't sublease. The park owner has to follow its own rules, park owner and park management. And it doesn't say anything beyond that. It just simply says that a park owner cannot ban or prohibit you as residents from subleasing your home if the park owner subleases. Now, if the park owner doesn't sublease, they can. They can say, we don't do it and you can't do it. If the park owner um, wants to continue to sublease at its homes, it can do so. It just has to let you, the homeowners, do the same thing. So I'm gonna segue into a couple of questions that we received about this. Um, we have a couple of questions um, that were submitted in writing that says, after January, 2022, can the park owners still buy homes and rent them? The answer is yes. This bill does not say anything about the homeowner buying homes. Absolutely, the homeowner can buy them. Uh, there's another question we're going to get to later that um, I'll reference more about that, but certainly in concept, they can do so. Can they rent them out? Absolutely, they can, but they have to let homeowners rent as well. They can't say, we get to do it and you can't. The new bill by Assemblymember Bennett does not allow that. Can the park only rent the ones they already own? No, they could buy more homes. This bill doesn't stop them from doing that. If a rental becomes vacant and then the park owner is not allowed to rent to another tenant, how will this be monitored? That part of the question is referring to the part of the bill that says that existing subleases are not affected by the bill. In other words, if the park is currently renting out 10 homes, those rentals can continue until they expire. We were concerned that we didn't want to immediately terminate subleases where people are renting homes and then they'd be told, sorry, you got to leave now because the park owner doesn't want residents to rent, so they're not going to rent, so you're out of here. We didn't want to prejudice existing um, subtenancies that way and kick people out of homes who really need you know, affordable housing. But when those rentals end in another six months or a year or two years, then that space is no longer sort of carved out as an exception. And the question here is, how will that be monitored? How will we know that the park owner isn't evading the law by secretly you know, renting out these homes? You know, there's not a police force that's going to be deputized to go around and check on that. To some degree, that information might come to light because you're in a rent jurisdiction and the city um, requires the park owner to report to the city which uh, spaces are under um, leases or rental agreements that could be exempt through 2025, or which are exempt because they're just renters. They're not actually homeowners that occupy the home. Uh, but otherwise, the residents are going to have to be the ones to really enforce it. You know, you're, It'll be people looking, watching, staying vigilant and saying, this looks like some kind of a rental over here, or they told me they were only renting. 
And it's going to be up to them to then notify the park. Um, we need some clarification. And if, the, if management just says, we're not going to talk to you about it, then your remedy is to go to the MRLPP, the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program uh, with HCD. We also had a report on that as part of the briefing yesterday um, that was very encouraging with some information about how many complaints HCD is triaging under that program. So it appears to be off to a very vigorous um, start. We also have a question related to AB 61. Now that um, 861 would allow residents to rent their homes if the park owner rents, obviously that's the big if, but if the park owner rents and so the residents get to rent now, then does the park owner have the right to interfere with the rental or otherwise approve renters as long as they meet certain requirements like age requirements? And I want to answer the question this way. Do they have a right to interfere with it? The answer is no. To me, interference means they're preventing you from doing it or they're creating conditions that are so onerous that nobody could sublease their homes if they wanted. So no, they can't interfere. However, this bill doesn't um, prevent the park owners from adopting reasonable rules and regulations regarding the subleasing. And they're going to do that, believe me. If a park owner wants to continue to sublease and therefore says, I will now open up subleasing to the residents, there will be requirements that they can reasonably um, enforce, including we have to know who your renter is and we have to approve them, not financially because they're paying rent to you under the sublease, but they have to at least be able to screen them down to know are these people that have been you know, thrown out of mobile home parks because they are chronic rules violators? Or they have to know how many people are there that you're you know, uh, intending to sublease to. They still have to comply with um, age restrictions or a number of person restrictions. They can still require that those people sign something that indicates uh, which vehicles they're driving, which vehicles will be you know, located within the park spaces and that they agree to follow the rules and regulations. The one thing I don't think they can regulate is the amount of sublease rent. The park owner should have really no ability to do that. And if a park tried to pass a rule, and I'm sure some will, that says, yeah, sure, we wanna rent so you can rent, but if you rent, um, you can only rent for this amount of money, uh, not a penny more. Or if you rent, you have to turn half that money over to us. Those kinds of things are so restrictive, in my opinion, that they would prevent residents you know, from being able to sublease. So it's really going to be uh, interesting to see what the response is. And believe me, there's always a response <laughs> from the other side. Getting back to 2782, um, I saw a lease recently with a provision that says, even if this lease loses its exemption under state law, you agree that as consideration for us giving you this great rental rate, the lease will still be exempt from local RSO. I've seen that provision already. Interesting, you know, good lawyering, I guess, right? Creative. But to me, that doesn't fly at all because local RSO ordinances undoubtedly would never have a provision that says, and any lease is exempt, which says it's exempt. I mean, if that was all that was required, every lease would just say it's exempt <laughs> and that would be the end of it. The only exemptions that RSO talk about are the 12 month exemption and that's ending now as we just discussed. Okay, so those are the remarks I wanted to make about those three topics. Um, one, more, um, one more question that I did get about 861. Um, will the park um, change over to no rent control status? Um, well, excuse me, let me let me make sure I break this out right. I thought if owners rent, then homeowners can rent. Our rules state there is no leasing or subletting. Well, that's because the law hasn't taken effect yet. Again, the law takes effect January 1st of 2022. Any park rules that conflict with the law are not enforceable. Right, we all understand that. 
you know, you don't have any power over a park um, saying, hey, here's a rule now and we're going to put it in writing and this is a rule. You don't have any power to say, no, we don't want you to enact that rule. But rules have to be reasonable to be enforceable and they can't be enforceable if they conflict with law. So if the park hat continues to have a rule that says you can't rent and you know the park owner is renting, that rule is not enforceable. Um, the other questions related or that this one person asked, and this is an interesting one. Uh, and I think this is one of those questions that as I read it, everybody's gonna go, well, I think the answer is sort of obvious. Can the owners help, quote unquote, help an elderly resident by telling them they don't have to pay rent, offer them thousands of dollars so they can live at their home with caretakers and pay their bills in exchange for taking a deed to their mobile home so that once the person passes away, the park owner owns the house, demolishes it, puts a new one in or rents it out. Do we think that's okay? <laughs> I mean, the way the question is posed, I think the answer is probably obvious. This sounds like elder abuse to me, telling somebody, don't pay your rent and we'll help you out. And by the way, just sign over title of the home to us. That sounds like pure and simple elder abuse. And the remedy for that is somebody needs to go to the district attorney because that's one of the most outrageous schemes I've ever heard of. And I think attached to the question was, um, if the park does this enough and acquires enough homes in this manner, will that affect our rent um, control status, our rent stabilization status? And that question really goes to the issue that um, some ordinances have, not a lot of them, but some ordinances have a provision. Um, there's probably 106 mobile home rent ordinances and cities and counties throughout California right now. I don't know how many, but a few of them have a provision that says, if at any time the total number of spaces covered drops below 50% or drops below 51%, then that park is no longer covered by the ordinance. So residents in those jurisdictions are concerned. We don't want the park owner acquiring so many homes that we all lose our protection under the ordinance. When the question is asked, will the park change over to no rent control status? The question, the answer really is, I don't know. It depends on what the ordinance says. Um, I think Oceanside is one um, jurisdiction where they do have an ordinance like that. And folks there are always very concerned. We don't want to drop below 50 or 51%, whatever the percentage is of covered spaces. Otherwise, the whole park loses its um, coverage. It really depends upon the jurisdiction. Number three, uh, a fairly lengthy question about rules and regulations. Um, and in this case, this is a unique situation that I've actually not encountered before. This particular park, uh, and by the way, let me just say that as I go through these, I know we're not allowing comments right now, but if anybody who submits any of these questions wants to follow up when I'm done, just you know, bookmark that and then you'll have a chance to do so, okay? To make sure I've answered the question fully. But right now we wanna get through these and we don't wanna identify who's asking the question unless they you know, voluntarily wish that. But this is a park where residents have been actually, and I saw the photos, they've been installing these gates uh, in their driveway areas. Um, I guess mostly sort of in the back end of the driveway and they've been putting up like a privacy sort of gate, some sort of a lattice thing or some sort of a wooden gate. And the park has now been issuing seven day notices saying you gotta remove these gates. And the question is, can the park do that? As I said, I haven't really seen this issue before for whatever reason. Um, the first question I would ask is, is there a park rule that says you can't have those gates? If there's no such rule, then I don't think the park could require you to remove them unless they otherwise violate a state law. And I looked up um, in Title 25, which is the building codes and standards for mobile home parks, in carport um, situations, Title 25 requires that at least two sides or one side and one end of a carport 
shall be maintained at at least 50% open and unobstructed at all times. If these gates were in some way running afoul of the state law and constituting an obstruction that um, would violate 1478 subsection E, um, then the park could well be within its rights to say that gate has to go. Again, if a park rule says it's gotta go or, or it can't be there, they might well be within their rights. Um, otherwise, the issue would be, is it some kind of a, uh, a, a new construction of some kind of an accessory structure or an, an add-on that requires park approval and you didn't get it before you put it up? That could also be an issue. The overriding thing that I'm looking at here is why would residents wanna do this? Why would they wanna put up a gate? And the park owner's concern, I guess, is we need to be able to see all the way down the carport because we don't want illegal storage. And I think there is a reasonable argument the park could make that if somebody puts up one of these gates, they could be a hoarder and they're just stacking up all kinds of stuff outside the home behind this gate on the, on the back end of the carport pad. Now we've got health and safety issues. We've got accumulation issues that violate the other rules and regulations that say that only barbecue or outdoor um, patio furniture is allowed outside the home. So, you know, it's kind of a dicey situation. I'd want to know more about it, but um, I guess I'll be vigilant to see, do we have any other parks around the state where this is happening? I just haven't seen it. I think it's a close call. And I think that if a resident gets a seven day notice and they say, nope, I'm gonna fight this, they better be ready to maybe have to fight it all the way. And the question is, if you get a seven day or more than one and you don't comply, you could be terminated for that. And then you're gonna end up in court. Um, and then the issue is gonna be, you know, again, is this reasonable? And will a judge pull the trigger on you and say, sorry, you've lost your home? People have to consider, you know, do they want to risk their home over this? But I'd be looking at the park rules um, and I'd be inquiring further of management. What's, what's your basis for this? Speaking of rules, the next question talks about the rule that we all know and love. You must keep your home site appearance neat. Okay, well, what does that mean? Um, if I asked for 10 definitions of neat, I'm sure to get at least 11 answers and it's really subjective. And I would say that based upon that rule alone, because the question is, isn't this too ambiguous to even be enforced? And I would say, yeah, it probably is. Um, unless it's very clear that somebody is just, you know, accumulating all kinds of stuff all over the home site and it's just a real mess. That's probably not gonna be enough all alone to give a seven day notice and proceed to court. And I think the, the park knows that. Typically though, that's gonna be followed up by more specific statements. They're gonna say it has to be neat and here's what neat means. No bicycles, no toys left outside, no tools, no clutter, no ladders, no garbage, no refuse, no cardboard boxes. In other words, there should be language that follows in the rule so that you have more of an idea of what that means. Otherwise, who knows what that means? One person's definition of neat is another person's definition of who knows what. So I think that would be difficult to enforce. So what's the best way to fight these notices? You just got to fight them one at a time. When, you know, folks, when you get a seven day notice, review it carefully, always respond in writing to management. One of three ways, either yes, I admit, um, there's a problem and I'm going to correct it. And then when you have corrected it, confirm that you corrected it, hopefully within seven days. Number two, I don't think it's an issue and I object and I need more information from you or otherwise I'm just not going to do it because here's why I don't think I have to. Number three, um, and maybe the way you don't always look at it is to look at the third one first. Do I even understand the notice? If the notice is vague and ambiguous, you need to tell management, I don't understand it. You've got to give me more information and clarify. For example, if you have 10 trees on your lot and the notice says, remove a tree and you don't know which one, <laughs> then you don't know what to do. And so you need to ask them to clarify. Um, another part of this person's, well, they, they actually, there's three questions that I received from, from this member. There are many hybrid parks 
in, in, in the Coachella Valley. You have mobile homes, your manufactured homes, you have RVs and you have park model homes, which are these smaller units that technically are not considered mobile homes by law. Some are under county or city RSOs, ordinances, but are not getting protections because management claims they're not considered mobile homes. What entity decides whether a home is covered by an RSO? Well, we have definitions of mobile homes contained in state law, but who decides whether a home is covered by an RSO? That's the jurisdiction, that's the city or the county. But I have to say that ordinances, rent ordinances cover parks. They very rarely don't cover individual spaces and parks. That would only happen if it's new construction Part of the park was expanded after 1993 and new spaces were added that are still, until we change that law, maybe coming up, those are still exempt as new construction. Or they're owned by the government or they're owned by the park, they're just rented out. Um, I haven't really seen parts of a park lose coverage because of the type of home that's on the space. Because again, under the MRL, RVs and park model homes are considered as mobile homes for all purposes other than the right to resell it. That's the only exception. If an RV has been in a park for nine months or more, it's treated as a mobile home um, for all other purposes. It's interesting that um, I learned uh, from handling a case a few years ago that if you have a park with 10 RV spaces located within a hundred space mobile home park, HCD can consider that those 10 spaces constitute a separate RV park within the mobile home park. This is something I never knew. I, I never knew that um, unless you had a real segregated area and had actually defined it that way, that this could happen. So it is possible and you'd have to check with your local rent jurisdiction, you know, the city or the county, whether they would consider some RV spaces within the mobile home park to be like an RV park enclave that's not covered by the ordinance. But that's a decision for the administrative city or county folks to make. The third question asked here was one that I think a lot of people are concerned about. If a park needs to shut down utility services like gas, water, or electric to make repairs, is there any law that governs how fast they must make those repairs? Um, in this park, they're shutting off gas for five days to make repairs. They're not allowing contractors to work overtime. They're using only two maintenance guys to relight pilots on 114 homes. And they talk about um, the fact that, well, we might be able to do this in one to two days, but we're gonna take five days because we don't wanna spend the extra money. There's really no law that I know of that says, you know, you got to repair utilities in a certain number of days or hours. But I, in my view, it has to be reasonable. That's another use of our reasonable term. And it can't be in a way um, that uh, would, uh, would injure folks. You know, you got spoiled food, you got the inability to take um, showers and so forth. I, I had a rent hearing in a San Jose park where, um, there are these huge eucalyptus trees all around the park and the tree roots over these decades have been wrapping themselves around utility lines and choking them and breaking them and interfering with them. And so there were a huge electrical problems and gas problems. And what the park did is they actually brought in portable showers so that the residents could um, continue to you know, be bathing and stay clean while they were fixing the gas issues. And they also brought in portable generators to keep electricity going while the electrical repairs are being made. And I would say that beyond probably 48 hours, I would say the park is obligated to do that. Um, too many people rely upon gas and certainly with electric, that's a no brainer to continue to be able to have habitable homes. Um, up here, we're all living under these uh, PG&E um, power shutoffs, safety power shutoffs. Um, I won't even get started about that. But 
um, you know, it's extremely inconvenient and anything more than I would say 48 hours at the very most starts to become injurious to the residents and may um, allow them to either make a claim under an RSO or make a claim for breach of contract under the lease. If your food spoils, you may need to have people organizing and everybody files small claims court actions for the amount of their food spoilage. And if the park owner gets served with a hundred small claims complaints, they're all gonna be consolidated in one hearing. Maybe the park will decide to, to be reasonable and play ball. Um, <clears throat> it can be expensive for them to bring in temporary utilities, but they might have to. Can a park owner randomly claim? Anytime you see randomly, I think we know what the answer is. Can a park owner randomly claim 40 to $50 per month pass-through expenses without itemizing those expenses? Uh, no. Um, if a lease or a rental agreement allows for pass-throughs or a rent ordinance allows for pass-throughs, they have to be itemized. The park simply can't say, we're passing through something where I'm going to tell you what it is or how we calculated it, just pay it. They can't do that. Typically, a rental agreement, if you review your language, it's going to say exactly how they need to notice the pass through and require them to verify it. And a rent ordinance would be the same way. Um, they, what they should be doing is sending something out that shows the calculation to the penny. The other part of the question was, would you expect the fee to be uniform from person to person? Yeah, I would, unless there's some reason that somebody's on a space that has some special you know, treatment that would, that would mean they'd get a different fee. Apparently in this park, this pass-through varies by $5 depending upon who gets the notice. Very suspicious as far as I'm concerned. Um, I get a notice like that. I'm gonna ask the, them in writing, please show me and verify the calculation. What is this pass-through for? How did you calculate it? The, the typical pass-through of a capital expenditure, for example. If you take a cost of $20,000, that should be amortized over a number of years, depending upon what the improvement is. Certain things like road repair should be far longer than something like you know repairing a clubhouse roof. But you have to amortize it and then divide it by the number of spaces equally so that everybody gets the same amount. Because it, you know in general, everybody should be treated equally because the pass-through um, benefit applies to everybody equally. And the notice attached here just talked about operating costs, property taxes, and insurance, $41.36. We got three separate pass-throughs, none of them itemized. All of them need to be itemized. And everybody should be treated equally for those. So good questions. We're getting some really good questions these days. Hopefully that... Um, is providing y'all with some really good information. Rules say no renting on January 1st, 2022. How do we proceed legally if the park continues to rent vacant spaces but has not modified the rules? Well, we covered that. You know, you can hire an attorney to, to make a demand. You can go to the MRLPP program at HCD and say the park owner is now violating the new law regarding subleasing restrictions. Our community is protected by rent stabilization. Effective January 1st, can the park buy units in the community and resell them? Again, yes, they can still do that. The, eight, the 861 Bennett bill doesn't change that. But as I said before, you wanna make sure that your rent control ordinance, your rent stabilization ordinance doesn't say if more than 50 or 51% are not covered, we lose the protection. But you literally can't stop the park from purchasing units. There was a question that had been submitted about the California climate credit for gas or electric. Um, and this was put into law some years ago that allows uh, residents to get a one time per year uh, monetary rebate for what's called the climate credit. You can go online and read up a lot about that. I had sent the information to this resident a few days ago so that um, she would have it. But the question was, what if we don't get our credit, our climate credit? What do we do? And if you go online, you'll see information about um, how to proceed. But the two contacts that you should make is number one, you contact your serving utility, PG&E in the north, 
SoCal Gas or Edison, the Semper Utilities in the South or San Diego Gas and Electric, and you say, hey, um, I didn't get my climate credit, I don't think. How much is it and what do I do? And hopefully the serving utility would step in and contact the park owner to make sure that that happens. The other contact you can make is to the California Public Utilities Commission, the CPUC, and say that we have a potential violation here. We're not getting our credit. You know, it, it's not a big amount of money per space, but it adds up if you combine many spaces in the park. Um, otherwise, small claim court's an option, but I think primarily I go to either the utility or I would go to um, uh, the CPUC. Um, another question about 861. All the homes in the, uh, the park owner now has, he can keep as rentals as long as the lease was signed before January 1st, 2021 and the tenant stays there. That's correct. Existing leases are not affected by AB 861. What happens if the tenant doesn't renew? Well, if the tenant doesn't renew, that space is no longer an exception and it has to be treated as the law requires. Must the park owner sell the home? N not necessarily. The park might say, we want to continue renting, so we'll change the rule and allow all the residents to rent. How is that enforced? Again, we talked about that, you know, residents monitoring, if it's a rent control or stabilization jurisdiction, they monitor and the homeowner could complain to the MRLPP program. Um, the city of Oceanside has announced water bills will be increasing in the coming year. How will that affect the billing to the homeowners? I mean, I don't have the answer to that. I need to know a lot more information. But if water rates are increasing, probably the rates to the homeowners will also increase. Um, and then there's an issue that's raised about the customer charge. Again, this is our new bill that was also just signed into law that now regulates customer charges. The park owner is going to have to follow the new law regarding what customer charges they can charge. It's no longer a wide open free for all. I think I might be able to get through the rest of these in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And so we should have a good part of our time here to open it up for follow up or for any questions that you have um, that haven't been submitted in writing. A couple of questions about this issue. Our rec room has been locked up for years other than pre-planned events. Can we possibly get a portion of our rent back? Again, this is a a question that the mobile home residency law very specifically governs under um, 798.24. Every common area facility shall be open or available to residents at all reasonable hours. Clearly, the park owner cannot lock the clubhouse and say only pre-planned events will allow you to use it. That's not legal. Can we get part of our rent back? Um, part of my concern about this question is it says our rec room has been locked for years. Uh, every legal action has what's called a statute of limitations attached to it. So you couldn't go back 20 years to get rent rebate. Uh, for a statutory violation, you typically have to file within three years of the violation. So I'd say if you could get a rent rebate, it's probably limited to three years, number one. And as far as whether you could get that back, you'd probably want to have some kind of description in a rental agreement or a lease of what the amenities are that are being provided. And it's pretty clear when somebody says rec room, to me, that means clubhouse. Almost every park has a clubhouse in California. Pretty clear, I think, that when you pay rent, you're presuming I get to use the clubhouse. It's a common area facility under 798.24. But it would be nice to have that in writing to also give your case some strength. In other words, what you're arguing is this is part of what I pay rent for. This is what I bargained for. I moved in here and I drove down the street and I saw a clubhouse. I said, hey, what a nice looking clubhouse. That would be a cool to be able to use that. And then when I moved in, I was told, oh, no, that's locked all the time. And you can only use it for pre-planned events that we get to approve. 
no, that's absolutely not um, legal. So next question. Um, this is interesting. Family owned park with a difficult manager. Wow, that's probably rare, huh? Difficult manager. I'm sure nobody on this call has a difficult manager or has ever encountered a difficult manager. Um, the park owner sent, uh, or uh, they sent a letter saying, you haven't restored our amenities back to the pre-pandemic hours. We still have things locked down. And they had referred to some of the um, information that we've created at GSMOL about that. I've written some memos. You can see those online about how amenities should be opening back up in accordance with local county health guidelines. The park owner got the letter, sent it back unopened and said, you have to go through the residence board for a vote first to see if the residence board will send the concern to management. We're not gonna deal with individuals. Well, that's completely fallacious, of course. There's no such law that says that if any number of residents, whether it's one or 50, has a concern um, that the park owner doesn't even have to respond until a resident board, whatever that is, confirms that this is a legitimate question. Not all parks have resident organizations. Um, they should, but not all do. And I don't even know what a resident board really means, but this looks like a stiff arm to me. This looks like the old Heisman Trophy pose, uh, to use a college football analogy on a college football Saturday in October, where they're just saying, you yeah, know, we're not going to answer this because you're just one person. Uh, and, and we don't think you really know what you're talking about anyway. So unless these people that we, uh, we recognize as directors of a board confirm it, we're not going to bother answering you. Um, the way you deal with that is you request a meeting with park management under the MRL in 798.53. Um, management must meet with any resident concerning park rules, standards of maintenance, addition or deletions of service or rental agreements. And one or more residents and representatives of them, if uh, they wish to designate them, can request a meeting and say, if you're not going to respond to my letter, I'm going to request a meeting under the MRL, under 798.53. And if you refuse that, now I have you in an MRL violation. I can get a $2,000 willful penalty, potentially, and I go to the MRL PP. I go to the program for enforcement. But this uh, member is correct. The residents board has no responsibility. They can chime in if they want. If I was a member of this park, I might say, I'd rather go to the resident organization and get them to buy into my complaint because it will have more strength coming from a group than just me. But it doesn't have to be that way. So we have a question about uh, what are the rights for use of the clubhouse? We talked about that. How do COVID rules affect the MRL codes? Well, again, they only affect the codes in terms of health and safety issues. If the county is saying you have to lock down, you have to lock down. But we're, we're past that now. And we have a lot of literature out there about that. Um, but we still have parks that are saying, you know, we're going to keep shut. This question says we're shut out till at least January. Um, I don't, I'm not aware, we, we, we left the color-coded county thing months ago, and I'm not aware of any county that's just locking everything down. You know, Australia's doing that, Japan might be doing that, it ain't happening in California anymore. Again, we've got our literature about that, and then remember the case up in Hayward, where the park owner chose to keep the swimming pool closed longer than the county said they needed to, and the residents went to, um, filed a service reduction claim with the city uh, under the city RSO and actually recovered a rent rebate because the park owner kept it locked down. So if you're in an RSO jurisdiction, you may have that ability. There's a question that's pretty specific actually that's kind of hard for me to, to answer, but we sued our property owner. Part of the lawsuit included an illegal contract we signed when we moved in. The property owner settled out of court. Does that mean the illegal contract is still valid? I mean, I don't know what's meant by a legal contract, but I would say 
if there was a settlement out of court, the answer to that depends on what your settlement says. <laughs> Hopefully your settlement agreement says that this contract is no longer enforced or enforceable. Would they be required to give new contracts out? No, again, you never have to sign another rental agreement or lease of any kind once you've already lived in the park. Are we still binded by the illegal contract even though the property owner admitted it was illegal? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I would say, I would wanna know what the settlement said and I would wanna know what was illegal about the contract. So kind of a hard question to answer, unfortunately. If the onsite manager is replaced, is the upper management or owner obligated to inform the resident of the new manager? Um, I don't think there's any specific law that says they have to, but why on earth wouldn't they? I mean, yeah, it's just a, a no brainer that, you know, if there's a, been a, an onsite manager change, you want your residents to know who the manager is. So if they're hiding that fact, that seems suspicious to me. And then a question that might be asked is, is there even a manager? Because every park with 50 or more spaces <clears throat> under Title 25 either has to have an on-site manager or, or emergency contact available. So if somebody's not telling you who the manager is, that raises suspicions in my mind. My uh, kids tell me the new word for suspicion is sus, because everything's being shortened. So uh, I'm sussed by that uh, question. I'm, I'm wondering about that. A resident gave 60 days notice of intent to sell home. Within days, the manager started giving that resident seven day notices, 14 day notices of violations. If you don't take care of the notices, I'm gonna evict you. Resident became physically sick, went to a mental health provider for help because of anxiety, da da da. Can HCD help? Can GSMOL help? Look, you know, it sounds like retaliation if somebody says I'm going to sell my home and then these notices start coming, it could be that the home is in really bad shape. The home site's in bad shape and maybe the park is entitled to give these notices. I don't know. Um, I'd have to see the notices and, and know again how the seven day notices need to be responded to. The follow up here was the resident was told we're going to cut down several trees and deduct the cost from escrow funds. No, the park owner has no ability to cut trees and deduct money from escrow funds. I would absolutely never agree to that with the escrow. And I would tell the park owner, you need to provide me with your legal authority for that. Because unless the resident caused the damage from the trees somehow, um, I don't think the resident has any liability for trees being removed. That's almost always on the park owner. Lattice has to be three feet up from the ground to allow fire department to pull hoses through openings. I'm not aware of that. I've never heard that. Maybe that's true. I'd check with the local fire department and I would check with HCD to see is, does lattice have to be at least three feet off the ground? Maybe it does. I don't know. All hanging plants must be removed from the carport. I mean, that's kind of a, I don't think that's a real significant issue. I'd probably do that in order to sell my house. Uh, because, you know, hanging plants are not fixtures. People might want to take them with them anyway when they move out. Install a divider between lots. I'm not sure really what that means. We're, we're, we're talking about like a railroad tie or a retaining wall or a fence. Climbing plants cannot be within three feet of the roof. That might be reasonable. You don't want stuff so high that it could start impacting structures. But I need to know more about it. Again, we want to be looking at reasonableness of those kinds of requests. Uh, this is an interesting question about transferring a, a mobile home on death. Are there drawbacks to completing a transfer on death form? I was told this simple form will allow ownership of a home to transfer immediately upon my death without needing probate. I got the form from HCD and so forth. Look, um, the form that HCD has is for non-probate transfer, but you don't file that until after somebody dies, okay? That form is not going to remove the need for a probate. I do estate planning work, and I can tell you that in California, a probate is required if you have more than $150,000 worth of assets. But interestingly, the value of a mobile home does not count towards that. 
So for many people who own mobile homes, if you don't have $150,000 in bank accounts or other assets that are not you know, jointly titled, husband and wife joint accounts are also exempt, well, there's not gonna be a probate anyway. This form is what's filed when the heirs get involved and say, we don't have to probate mom or dad's estate and we wanna sell the home or transfer it to one of us so we can live in it. That's when you file the form but the person doesn't file it before they die. I'd say, go talk to a lawyer about estate planning, prepare a will, um, put somebody in as a joint owner during your lifetime if you want, but that form comes into play later. Another question here about, as we're getting to the last few, um, Sonoma has rent stabilization, but I can't find any reference to whether if the park has over 50% spaces rented or owned, there's an issue with that. And I can't find any place in the MRL that speaks to that. Are we in danger of losing rent control or losing our right to live here because changing to rental only? Well, again, you're not gonna lose your right to live there unless the park is going out of business and changing its use. But this is that same question. You know, If the park is acquiring homes and gets more than 50 or 51%, do we lose rent stabilization protection? I don't know it have to depend on the ordinance, but if you can't find any reference in your ordinance, it's probably not there. And so, no, it's probably not an issue. Um, the MRL does not speak to the issue. The MRL does not speak to um, rent issues. That's all local. Interesting question. What happens when a park um, loses its permit to operate by HCD? The HCD suspends the permit to operate. This is um, what I refer to as the death sentence, where the park is violating laws or codes and HCD gives them a whole series of notices and ultimately says, you haven't fixed this, you're not going to lose your permit to operate. Um, what that means is the park cannot collect rent. The residents get to live there for free. <laughs> I've seen it happen. It doesn't happen often, but it does. So um, if you reach the point where that happens, HCD will come into the park and post notices to that effect. So the residents will know. It doesn't happen often, but it could. And that's why parks typically have incentive to correct their violations. How can a park raise rent during a pandemic while having amenities closed? Why isn't there some form of rent control in mobile home parks? Obviously a very general question. Um, Parks can raise rent during pandemics or no pandemics um, unless there is a regulation in place. And about 106 cities and counties do have such regulation, but not everybody does. I don't know where this question comes from, whether it's an RSO jurisdiction or not, but that's why we have an ongoing um, business model, if you will, with the Ed Fund and GSMOL to try and get as many jurisdictions covered by rent stabilization as possible. and can speak to this very specifically in ongoing efforts that she's had over the years, as have I. Um, you know, currently we have discussions like that occurring in Santa Maria and other jurisdictions. Most jurisdictions that have had ordinances historically have been in the higher density coastal areas where rents were rising more rapidly in prior years and the local legislature, city council or board of supervisors responded. That's now, the revolution is being exported to the more central valley and conservative areas because rents are rising there too and affordable housing is on everybody's minds. We, uh, GSML has many resources. We have a rent ordinance manual and you can talk to um, representatives, you know, um, zone leaders about how to approach that, how to make that happen, either by getting something passed by city council or board of supervisors or by a ballot measure. Um, rent statement includes sewer water trash. These costs are going up. Homeowners are stunned by how monthly utility bills are increasing beyond what they were budgeting. I'm sure we all are. This is concerning the anticipated 50% increase in energy costs this winter. Question, can a homeowner be evicted for failing to pay utilities? Absolutely, you can. 
Utilities are considered part of the rent charges of the park that they legitimately can bill you for. Is there ever a case where a homeowner is safe from eviction if they only pay their rent and don't pay their utilities? No. First of all, the park probably won't even take that check because it's a partial payment. But you could be evicted even if you pay your base rent. You can still be evicted for not paying utilities. You got to pay utilities. Park management can use to make new rules. Can't have a meeting in the clubhouse without a written proposal detailing their meeting. They will then consider the proposal and let us know if the meeting is allowed. Uh, I don't think we have to go much further to know that is absolutely wrong. That's illegal. Again, clubhouse must be open and available at all times. Now, management has a right to know if you're going to have a meeting, what it is. You know, you can't have um, Amway meetings that are soliciting uh, commercially. You can't do certain things that could run afoul of commercial purposes. You also, if you want to rent or reserve the room for a bar mitzvah or a wedding reception or a funeral or memorial service, they have a right to know are people coming from out of the park. But homeowners who just want to have a meeting, no. They can't stop that. 798.50 and 51 and 52 speak to that very specifically. Um, also, management does not talk to us or notify us about rules changes or put them in writing. Folks, if a rule is not in writing, it's not a rule. <laughs> There's no such thing as a verbal rule. That doesn't happen. It has to be in writing. And we have a very specific procedure in the MRL for the amendment of rules in um, 798.25. They have to give you 10 days notice that there's going to be a meet and confer meeting to discuss the rules. And then the rules take effect six months later, unless they are um, an emergency measure in reaction to a change in the law or um, if they, which could be immediate, or if um, it concerns the, the um, common area facilities, like hours of the pool or something, those take 60 days to take effect. Otherwise, um, only if the resident signs and says, I agree the rule takes effect immediately. Um, well, that's why we advise people never sign the rules to have them take effect immediately. Always give a chance for them to come into play after the required notice periods. Last couple of questions. Um, an interpretation of 2782 again meant that as of a certain date, there would no longer be any long-term leases. Again, that bill does not say no more leases. It only governs the exemption from the financial requirements. Will all leases be required to be rewritten because of 2782. No, they don't have to be rewritten. It just means there's no more exemption and the local ordinance applies. Um, and do residents in RSO areas need to remain vigilant to be sure local laws do not change? Well, always, you know, that's always, absolutely always the case. There was a question here about, will people be allowed to rent out their homes? Well, maybe, maybe not. It depends on what the park wants to do. Under AB 861, as we've discussed, if the park says we're going to rent, then you get to rent. If the park says we're not renting, nobody rents, then you can't rent, except under the emergency um, sublease that's allowed now under the MRL, which says you can rent for up to 12 months for medical necessity um, if you have to relocate away from your home and so forth. And that's a right that's already been in effect for some years, um, but, and that's under 798.23.5. This is something much broader that we've been talking about today. Um, there's a real good question I wanna make sure I answer. AB 978 was just passed. This is the uh, famous Quirk Silva, Assemblywoman Quirk Silva bill that says um, there's now caps on mobile home rents. This only applies to a park that is in a split jurisdiction where half the park is in one city and half the park is in another. To my knowledge, there's one park in the state of California where this is true. And it's located half in the city of Anaheim and half in the city of Fullerton. 
AB 978 does not apply to any other parks in California. There is still no statewide mobile home rent control. It's a local issue and we want it kept that way. Does AB 1482 apply to mobile homes? That's another COVID relief rent restriction bill. The answer is no. AB 1482 specifically does not apply to mobile homes. Um, okay, a letter sent to park owner about getting amenities back. I think we already talked about that when they just sent it back unopened and said, see the rent board. We already talked about that one. There was a question that I can't really answer. They're the last two questions. And this is a question about um, a home burned down due to fire hydrants not being operational. And this member appealed to HCD and they haven't been able to help her. What authority governs the situation? Who's supposed to have copies of fire hydrant test reports? What are the regs for fire hydrants for parks built in 1963, et cetera? You know what? I think this all is governed by local government, whether it's the local fire um, authorities. You know, I'd be contacting um, your local fire department, um, trying to find the most authoritative person, the fire chief, the fire marshal. I'm not sure that Title 25 has a lot of regulation about fire hydrants. Um, it's a really specific issue. Um, HCD, I think, has some involvement, but I'm not sure how much. So it might be local and then local government, whether you contact your city manager or board of supervisors about that. So sorry, I'm not familiar with that specific issue. The final question is really concerning um, the ability of residents to acquire their park. This question is saying, how can we organize in a manner that gives us more leverage on topics like rents, maintenance of the park, um, use of the park facilities? Well, you know, you want to definitely always organize because um, a voice is much stronger when it's a chorus as opposed to one person, you know, in the corner of the park down at the end of a cul-de-sac that they can just ignore. When you get 10, 20, 50, 100 or more people all joining together, far more effective to negotiate things and to get things done. Um, that's a GSM well chapter. That's a homeowners association. That's any kind of unified collective of folks. Part of the question talks about discussing nonprofit status in case we need to mount a purchase, doubtful we could afford the park. Well, you know what? We have lots of resources. There are a ton of resources available on the GSM Well website that our resident on Park Vice President David Loop has developed that show you, walk you through the steps of how you can provide notice to your owner that if the owner puts the park on the market, they have to give you uh, the right to receive that notice and make an offer. It's not a right of first refusal. We don't have that yet. Maybe we'll have that someday, but it's not there in the law yet. But currently under the law, um, if you organize uh, an organization, you can call it uh, the Park Purchase Committee or whatever you wanna call it. And it's in civil code 798.80. You don't have to incorporate and pay all the corporation fees. It can be an unincorporated entity. But every year you say, hey, Mr. Park owner, uh, this is our park purchase committee. Anne is the president, Shelly's the vice president, and Henry is the treasurer. If you are ever putting the park on the market, please provide notice to us at this address. That's all you have to do. And we have the form of that letter available for you on the website. So I'd encourage anybody who wishes to put that committee together to go to the GSM well website. As David Loop were here, he would quote the great Wayne Gretzky, who said, 100% of the shots you don't take don't go in. That means that you don't know whether you can afford to buy the park until you try. And believe me, 
if you went and talked to some of the folks that have acquired their parks, almost to a person, they would say, we never thought we could do it. At the beginning of this, we never thought we could do it. But you know what? They did it because there are ways to do it. And the information that Dave Loop has developed will, will confirm that. OK. I have made it through about 25 to 30 pages of these. And hopefully, you found that information helpful. I think now at 11.18, and we can, uh, I'm ready to just open it up to any follow ups to what I've talked about or any new questions. Okay, thank you, Anne. Uh, I just want to follow up with something Anne said. Some people who are sitting in the meeting with their hands raised, you've already asked at least one question in chat. So until everybody has a chance, if your question, if I ask your question in chat, then you're going to have to wait till everybody else has had a chance to speak. So uh, I'm not trying to be hard nosed, but uh, we need to treat everyone equally and give everyone equal time. Okay, so the first question I have in chat is, our park owner wants our lakefront spaces and he has implied he will refuse to sign a new long-term lease if we refuse to sell to him. Can he do that? The homes have been there since, 1992 and he told my wife this is his space and he will take it back if she doesn't sell to him when when they decide to sell at the way under market price he is offering well i think that almost anybody on this call can answer that question because that is absolutely flatly illegal it's a threat that could never be enforced no park owner can ever tell you, you have to sell to me or you can't sell. That would be a restraint on trade. That would be uh, similar to what we would call antitrust. That would be an unlawful business practice. And it would also be very similar to something called a tying arrangement. <clears throat> and there's a very specific case way back decades ago about that where the park owner, you know, in a similar vein said, <clears throat> if you're going to fix up your home, you can only use this contractor who happens to be my brother. Um, that's an unlawful tying ar arrangement. And the district attorney actually filed a lawsuit in that case and won it. But yeah, that, that would be an outrageous demand that could never be enforced. And I would invite the park owner to try and say, you know, I'm going to list my home for sale. And if you interfere with my sale because you say I have to sell to you, then um, you know then it's on. Yeah. Okay. So the first person I see with their hand up is Mary Lou Hensley. So go ahead, Mary Lou. Hi, Mary Lou. Be sure you're off mute. All right. It took a while for me to get there. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I am going to try to keep this brief. It is deep. I've gone online trying to find um, the legalities around cameras on our park. We all know we have them, but now someone's starting a petition to have the cameras removed. The outside management company speaking on behalf of the managers here has told me they're there for our protection. Um, they also have audio. And um, uh, so my concern is, my question is, uh, the petition I don't think is going to go anywhere. Isn't there supposed to be signage so that you know you're being recorded and filmed around the property where each camera is? Shouldn't there be a sign? Is this in the common areas, indoors only or outdoors too? Where are these cameras? Oh, right. outside oh. the office door, the pool area, the back of the clubhouse uh, towards the street, okay. back in the okay. RB parking and inside the clubhouse which has a lot of people very upset because our Gizmo meetings are supposed to be private and they think they're going back in and listening. So. Uh, yeah, you I know, have... um, cameras are going to be permissible as long as they don't invade the privacy of residents. Mm -hmm. So cameras that are trained inside homes, obviously that's a problem. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the last time that we were talking, she called you. That was. Yeah, we got some background noise. 
we got to get rid of it. Um, Could so, you repeat that? It's a background noise. Uh, invade the, so there's no expectation of privacy when we're out walking the area or in the clubhouse. Correct. So our meetings aren't private then in that sense. We run no. the risk of whatever they're not. There's nothing we can do. Well, I, I don't disagree that if there is camera surveillance with audio, there likely should be a sign that says, you know, this room is being um, subjected to video and audio surveillance so that somebody does know. Um, if somebody's being recorded without their permission, the law doesn't say that's illegal per se, as I understand it, but what it says is you can't use that recording anywhere because the person didn't know, so you couldn't use it in a court of law. If the concern is we're having a GSMO meeting, we want it to be private, I would say if you've got something that's that private, you may want to consider moving the meeting elsewhere. Years ago, we always used to run into this question where people would say, we don't want the manager coming in, you know, to our meeting. And I would say, look, put the manager in the front row. You know, the manager needs to be educated maybe about a lot of things. As long as you don't have a situation where management's presence is having a chilling effect, I will use a term that is used in the law, a chilling effect upon the willingness of the members to meet because they're afraid of retaliation. Years ago, we had a very acrimonious situation in a park and management was bringing lawyers into the meeting and they were coming in and sitting in the front row and opening their yellow legal pads up, putting their pen in their hand and being you know, ready to take notes. That was extremely, talk about a chilling effect. I mean, that has the effect of you know, almost preventing people from meeting at all. But if there's just a silent camera or audio going, I mean, you could ask management, please turn it off during our meeting and maybe they'll do it. Um, and let's just say it's too much of a hassle to interrupt the feed. But I would say really, unless you've got something extremely confidential, um, that shouldn't be an issue. Now, some residents say, I don't wanna stand up in a meeting and say something because I'm afraid of retaliation. You just have to tell people, look, Anybody who walks through this door and shows up at the meeting could potentially be retaliated against. Choose your words carefully in the meeting, but you get, let's stand up for each other. That's why we have a chapter. That's why we have an HOA. We're gonna protect each other from that kind of you know, rank retaliation. And that's part of why GSMOL exists, part of what we do. So bottom line, there's no law that signage needs to be up. You know, um, I'm gonna profess to not know whether there is a specific law about that. I would say that if they ever wanted to use the recording, yes, there would have to be some kind of advance. Otherwise okay. they could do it, but they can't ever use it anywhere because you can't tape a phone call, you can't tape a conversation without the person knowing about it and then try to use it in a court of okay. That okay. I can tell you. So if I'm smart, uh, appreciate it. I'm going to have those signs if I'm smart, if I'm management. Yeah. Thanks for that Thank question. You. Okay, Martha, over to you. Okay, uh, Bill Seaton, your question is next in chat, but you also have your hand up. So if I ask your question in chat, you're going to have to go to the back of the line on the computer. Martha, my question in chat is actually for a member who's on the... Um, who's on the call right now, but I don't know if she knows how to, to do it. Okay, very good. I'll take, I'll take the question and uh, uh, from chat. Okay, the next question is, can the park owner place stipulations on how you must sublease? For instance, can they mandate that you only do short-term rentals? We are seeing park owners trying to force homeowners to rent only Airbnb style, short-term hotel-like rentals? End of question. Well, to get back to the, the question that you actually had asked, Martha, that I addressed at the very beginning of our session, I think that reasonable requirements and restrictions can be placed on subleasing going forward as the new bill may be opening more of that up. But this is really interesting to me because in my experience, park owners regulate exactly the opposite. 
they do not want short-term rentals. They would say short-term Airbnb rentals are a catastrophe for our park. you got different people coming in every weekend, every week. They're going to have parties. They're going to, especially if you're in a you know, coastal area, there's going to be loud music. We have no way to stop it because they're only here for a week or a few days and they leave. I think a park is well within its rights, actually, to say no Airbnbs and no short-term rentals. I think that would be actually reasonable. If a park is saying that's all we want, I don't get that at all. That seems completely counterintuitive. The kind of sub-tenancies that you would want to have and that any resident would really want to have are the kind that are um, verifiable, longer term, that people have more of, a, of a, a stake in following the rules because they're there for six months or a year or two years or whatever. Um, I think there's a great concern that these short-term rentals are going to be a problem. I can give you an analogy, and somebody like Jerry Bowles, who's on the call, will know. In davis Sterling, a new law has just gone into effect that says a park owner that is resident owned cannot restrict rentals um, more than 25%. They have to allow at least 25% of the park to be able to rent out homes. However, short-term air and B&B style rentals are exempted from that. So resident owned parks can um, prevent those. And I think if resident owned parks can prevent them, then, um, you know, a mobile home park owner, an investor park owner could as well. Again, it's very odd they would say the opposite. Um, I, I'm not even sure how to respond to that. Clearly, longer term subleases cannot be restricted. There's no reason to say people who want to rent for six months or a year can't do so. That would make no sense to me. Okay, so Bill Seaton, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, the question I have personally, Bruce, is in my park, uh, we notified management that they were in violation of the MRL as it relates to utilities. Um, they have been using uh, our utilities to run, uh, we, have, we all have garage lights that act as street lights in here. Um, and then they're using our utilities to run sprinklers and other, other uh, common area devices. So we notified the park. Um, one of us settled, the guy, me, I notified them, I settled. Uh, and instead of meeting with the rest of the owners, what the park did was forced a $1 per month credit on every resident in the park, along with a lease addendum that said, if you accept the credit, uh, you are going to indemnify us. We've been fighting them for about five months now to try to get the credit revoked, to get them to the negotiating table to pay us fairly for what they've been using over the last 30 years. Um, but we're at an impasse. They are basically refusing. And I am just wondering, advice-wise, would you recommend MRLPP, uh, small claims court, try to find a class action attorney? We're, because at this point, there are literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that uh, we believe that the homeowners are being um, uh, shorted because of the, the amount that they've decided is a fair settlement. Thanks. I would not recommend MRLPP if you're talking about that kind of money, Bill. I would say, and, and small claims court jurisdictions, only 10,000 per person. Um, I think the residents need to make that decision, but I would say maybe we need to have a conversation offline about this. If you wanted to consult with me directly, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I would seek legal advice because clearly there's a violation here, right? At the heart of it, we know there's a violation. I would, I would say no resident should sign anything <laughs> until they fully understand what they're signing, what they could be giving up. And if it's only a dollar, that's, I don't know that that does it at all. I, I'd wanna know more about what the amount of the charge is, how long it's been going, how, how long can we go back and recover for this? Yeah, so. Okay. But the bottom line is park owner cannot run its common area utilities off homeowner lines. The MRL does talk about that. They have to notify you if that's the case. 
Um, we have people that, you know, commonly the street light in front of your house, someone finds out, oh, I'm paying for that street light. Well, no, that's obviously wrong. They either have to disconnect that or give you some kind of a financial compensation for that. Yeah. Okay, Martha. Uh, can the manager give a seven day notice, then come back months later and give a second notice with new items on it, yet the first notice items have been taken care of? And, and so on and on and on. Well, yeah, I mean, if a seven day notice is given and you cure it, uh, they can give a new seven day notice for new items, sure. I mean, uh, the thing that you wanna be vigilant about is a series of notices, which really pretty clearly begins to constitute harassment. Um, the key from my perspective would not be so much, you know, are they giving other notices? I would be one of looking at what's in those notices. Are they legitimate items, legitimate rules violations? A seven day notice is given for rules violations, nothing else. So the issue is, are they legitimate? Are, th are there actually rules in place? which they can base a violation on and have those rules been violated. Uh, I've, I've got a follow-up question because this may be what she was getting at, although she didn't put it in the chat, Bruce, and I'm struggling with the humongous chat, so I don't have a chance to grab my mobile home residency law. Isn't there something in the mobile home residency law that says if you get so many notices on the same topic, could, could you address that one? Well, yeah, what it says is that it's 798.56 subsection D as in dog. And what it says is um, that they have to give you a seven day notice before um, they can proceed to terminate your tenancy for a rules violation. But if the homeowner has been given a written notice of an alleged violation of the same rule, or regulation on three or more occasions within 12 months, then they don't have to give you another notice. They can just go straight to a 60 day termination notice. So, you know, if, you, if you're violating a park rule about parking and they give you a seven day notice and then another one and then another one, and you've gotten three within 12 months for the same violation, the next notice you get can be a 60 day termination notice with no seven day opportunity to cure it. That's what the law says about that. Okay, thank you. Next is Rodney. Go ahead, Rodney. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, Bruce, I'll make it real quick. I live in Oceanside yeah. and uh, I pay $500 a month for space rent. Uh, since the owner can't get around our rent control, he's buying units and renting them. Come January, if he doesn't change the park rules and nobody can rent, can he sell one of his rentals to a new owner and keep it at the space rent that he's currently charging, which is 2100 or would that unit then revert back to the $500 a month rent control that I'm paying? Well, again, AB 861 doesn't stop a park owner from selling a unit. Park owner has ability to, if the park owner, are you saying in this case the park owner owns the home and is subleasing it? Yes, the park has, has bought like 20 units and they're renting them and they're substantially higher. They're about four times the price that I'm paying as a resident. Well, and, and that would make sense because they're renting the home and the space. So those, okay. people, are, those people are going to pay a lot more because unlike you, they don't own the home. Okay. And if they were to go into the community and, and find a two bedroom, two bath home of comparable square footage, they might pay 2000 for that. But, but can so, he keep buying and selling at a higher rate and then just, you know, get around the rent control? Well, rent control probably doesn't apply to units that he owns. So the answer is probably yes. Unless the ordinance specifically regulates the amount that he could rent the home for. Mm -hmm. And there's only one jurisdiction that I know of <laughs> that's trying to do that. And I think it's totally improper. And it happens to be the city of East Palo Alto, where we've got, I represent a, a guy who owned five homes and was told 
the rent restriction in Palo Alto sets what's called a maximum allowable rent, which in this case is like $310 a space. And, and he was told, by the way, we have a new non-splitting rule. So this means the total rent for that space, including subleases of the home, is $310. That basically means that my guy's paying $310 to rent the space from the park. He's trying to sublease, and they're telling you, you can't charge more than zero for a sublease, which makes no sense. But I would just say, yeah, if the park owner owns the unit, it's probably exempt from the ordinance. So they can probably charge whatever rent they want. And, you know, a renter is not like you. The renter doesn't own the home. They're not captive. They're not immobile. If they think it's too high, they're just going to say, I'm not going to rent it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Martha. Yeah, hold on. Believe it or not, I'm still being flooded with questions. And folks, just as a reminder, you can't ask 20 questions at once. You're only going to get one bite of the apple. And then we, 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 uh, we, we go around. Okay, the next question is, if your park has a meeting room or library, as well as a large clubhouse, if the library is open 24 seven, can that be considered as providing reasonable access to the facility? Well, I'm not I, sure. I guess, if, I'm I not sure. Would, I'm there sorry, may be ahead. typos in the question, Bruce. I guess I would need to know more about the configuration of this building. Most times a library is one room within a clubhouse, but the, the statute doesn't say, you know, at least one room in a common area facility has to be open at all times. It says each common area facility, and that's the entire thing. You know, the bathroom, the main clubhouse meeting room, the kitchen, it doesn't mean the office. It doesn't mean the rental office where the employees work. That's not a common area facility that everybody can just walk into. But I would say just saying that the library is open and we can close everything else. No, that, that does not meet the law. Okay, next is PC, go ahead. Is that me? That's you. Right. Well, <clears throat> I think it's somebody else actually, right. but we can get back. Oh, I'm to sorry. That. Okay. She started to talk, but she's on mute still, so we couldn't hear. All right. Her. Okay. Her Some somebody identified as PC. Yeah, she needs to unmute. There. Oh. Thank yeah. you. There you go. Okay. There you sorry, go. Sorry, sorry, Bruce. Hi, my name is Maria. I have a question. How can I? Well, I'm. Uh, I've been um, fighting for rent control for almost two years in Pico Rivera. We are on the meeting for next meeting on October so we can discuss rent control. Now, my question is how can I, I, I can educate the assembly women that's coming to our community? Mm -hmm. How can I summarize and give information right. so they can understand the difference between, uh, you know, adding us as apartments and homes because we don't have those same laws. Right. And it, it seems like they don't wanna understand it. I understand I your question. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of information at GSM Well to help you. You said Pico Rivera? Yes. Okay, that's in LA area, right? LA County. Okay, you need to contact, um, are you a GSM Well member? Yes. Okay, you need to contact your zone vice president. Her name is Mary Jo Beritich, your zone C vice president. You contact Mary Jo, she's gonna start giving you a whole bunch of information. If we need to become involved, there are ways through the Ed Fund that we may be able to become involved since you're in the LA area as well, uh, because of the area that you're in, um, where we can actually arrange meetings with um, anybody that we need to, city council, board of supervisors folks who need education, we can set up those kind of meetings. Um, but otherwise, we can give them written information and we can set up meetings with them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Back to Martha. Okay, hold on. Just, uh, I'm still getting flooded with questions. And thank you, Henry, for, for sending an email to this one lady saying, contact GSMOL. It would take an hour to answer your questions. So um, I'm trying to find ones that can be answered quickly. 
Okay, the next question is, do we have a right to be notified of a pending sale? And this is not the sale of the park. We only found out by accident when we saw a notice posted on the door of the deceased owner's trailer. No, there's no law that says you have the right to be notified that somebody's home is selling, if that's the question, no. I mean, there, what purpose, I, I see no purpose for any resident needing to know whether a particular home in the park is selling. I mean, a lot of times they're listed for sale on an MLS, you're gonna see a sign out front, but somebody could just doing a, be a, doing a for sale by owner. So no, I don't think you'd have any right to that. Okay, uh, Martha, is it your turn again? No. Oh, okay, go, we'll go to Dan Drummond then. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Um, Nice and lighthouse. Oh, <laughs> I think it's Point Arena. Uh -huh. um, my question is going to be per MRL section 798.73, removal of mobile home upon sale to third party. Mm -hmm. So when a park, when park management requests a Title 25 inspection by the HCV on an older mobile home, does park management need to pay for that inspection per subsection D, which states the management shall bear the burden of demonstrating that the mobile home is in a significantly rundown condition or in despair. Yeah, this is the resale eviction protection statute as I think it was called when GSMOL got it passed into law. I actually know a lot about this section because I had a litigation, a three day trial about it about 15 years ago that we prevailed on. And I ordered the entire legislative history of the bill that put this into law. Um, I'm not aware that HCD actually does um, inspections like that unless there's a health and safety issue alleged. And if there is, if the park owner is the one ordering it, absolutely, the park pays for it, absolutely. Um, again, if there's a health and safety issue, HCD is not gonna charge anybody to initially come out and determine, is there a health and safety or imminent hazard. They don't charge for that. There may be charges down the road for informal conferences or other things. If a park owner is gonna pay a, for a private inspection, first of all, they'd have to get the resident's consent to even in, you know, have an inspection on the inside of the home. The park only has jurisdiction on the outside of the home. We know that from the very next section, 73.5. But yeah, bearing the burden certainly would mean they're gonna to have to come up with evidence. And that would mean at some point, like in the case that I had, um, where the park um, owner said, you can't sell any home in my park that was built before 1972 because it's a fire hazard. Well, how do you know that? Well, cause the, you know, the, the standards of construction were different then there's formaldehyde and all this other stuff. Well, he was wrong about all that, number one. But number two, this home was in great condition. And so they got an inspection, we got an inspection, I had a better expert than they had at trial, and we won. But I've probably gone beyond your question. If, if so park management should not request the resident pay for an inspection. No. I mean, they could say the resident needs an inspection of their own because we think there's a health One inspection. question. But no, they can't, they can't say, you know, you have to pay for an inspection that I'm going to order. Okay, yeah, I, I was in the MRL says that the inspection has to be done. And you asked your question already. Yeah, I, I'm okay, I'll stop. Okay, Martha, over to you. Uh, our park owner subleases on a short term basis. This is real interesting, Bruce, this one, on a short-term basis, but he makes people pay for a permit to sublease and does not let everyone sublease. Is this legal? No. A park owner can only charge for three things, rent, utilities, or a service rendered. This would have to fall in under the category of a service rendered in theory because it's not rent and it's not utilities. But a service rendered would be something like the park has built a dog run for the residents to use to exercise their dogs. The dog run costs 
so much money to build. To defer the cost of that, we're going to charge a dollar for any resident who has a dog who wants to use the dog run, or whatever it is. You know, saying that you have to get a permit to sublease, um, that's no service rendered, especially now under the new law that will take effect January 1st. If the park owner is subleasing, he has to allow all the residents to sublease. There's no service being rendered. That's an illegal charge. Okay, thank you. The next is Doris. Go ahead, Doris. Doris, take yourself off mute. I don't see Doris on the screen. She might be away. Okay. We might okay. want to skip her and come back. Yeah, in that case, we'll go on to Paul and Michelle. Ah. Hi, I'll try to keep this uh, real short. When we moved in about six years ago, there was a flooding problem in our yard and the owners took charge of it. They ran a V ditch underneath our back patio to render this situation. And now we cannot do anything with our back patio. We can't replace it because there's water under it. Was this legal what they did? What recourse do we have to be able to, our back patio is all termite infested and needs to be replaced. What can we do to replace our, we could have replaced it before they ran the water ditch. And now they put this uh, drainage ditch underneath it and the inspector tells us that we can't do anything with it. Yeah, I mean, this is a real specific question that requires a lot more information, I think. You, I, I think you really wanna seek legal advice about this folks because the park owner is responsible for drainage issues, pure and simple under Title 25, unless you cause the problem, the park has full responsibility for that. And if they attempted to mitigate that and in doing so cause damage, and you can prove that, that what they installed is the proximate cause. And when you say patio, I think we're talking about a deck of or a wooden structure of some kind when you mentioned termites. Yes. We're not talking about a cement patio. No. So if, if you can show that that fix that, that they did, that they attempted, has caused damage that proximately has um, damaged you financially, or you got to replace the deck, or we got to do some other fix. Yeah, there could be liability there, but it's pretty. It, this is a more extensive situation that I think requires more specific legal attention, in my opinion. Okay, okay so seek the advice of a lawyer is what I hear. Absolutely, yes. I think you'd have in concept without knowing anything more than what you just told me, in general, there could be liability there on the part of the park owner, absolutely. Thank okay, you. thank you. Okay, back to Martha. Okay, just housekeeping and heads up, Todd B has already had a question answered in the chat. So until we get through everybody, as we agreed, uh, he's gonna have to wait his turn. So the next question is, we are an RSO park. When a home that was in the park before 1990 sells after 1990, are the new owners also under RSO? Yes. Okay, that was quick, thanks. <laughs> okay, very good. Next is Michelle. I know Michelle, this is gonna be her question. How many park managers does it take to screw in a light bulb, right? Amen, Bruce. Thank yeah. you. Okay, that's all I have. No, <laughs> no, I actually I was on the uh, MPN meeting yesterday. And one of the things that that continues to go, why can't homeowners be notified of the exact time, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and why can't homeowners and or park managers accompany? I uh, Diamond K was um, inspected are park wide. And I spoke with one of the administrators for almost an hour. And one of the reasons that they don't want to have residents accompany and park owners or managers accompany is because when a resident is given a violation, that's confidential. The park owner or manager does not get any information on what that is. The homeowners then allowed the 60 days to, to fix it. If it isn't fixed, that's when it goes to the park owner and they're notified of the violation. So if you've got a park manager wandering around with the inspectors, 
that violation isn't confidential anymore. That was the way it was explained to me. And I, I wish they'd been a little more clear about that at the NPM yesterday. But anyway, just FYI. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Okay, Martha, back to you. Yeah, just be aware, Anne, there's a bit of a delay because I have to go back and forth between mute and then the questions. Okay, the next question is, I tried to find out what units the park owner owns. HCD wants me to pay $25 for each unit times 160 units. So that would cost me $4,000. Well, if you... If you're going to try to verify ownership of any home through Department of Housing, which also means you're going to have to have very specific information about that, including possibly decal number and so forth. Yeah, if you're going to pay for an informal title search, then you would have to pay 25 bucks a shot. Um, anybody in the public has to pay that. My question is, why would you want to go through that process, though, at HCD? And why are you inquiring about that? If the, if the issue is, I'm afraid that the park owner is acquiring so many homes that we could lose rent control protection if we're in a rent RSO jurisdiction, I would say go to the city because the park has to report to the city which homes it owns. And I would go there first. I would get a list from the city or the county. And then I would try to do my own work, you know, investigative work as a person or as a resident or entity or group and say, um, what do we see about this home? Are people coming and going that we don't know? Um, is there any evidence that this looks like it's a rental as opposed to a homeowner occupied home? What can we find out anecdotally within the community? And then if something doesn't match up between the city or county records and what you're seeing, that might be one particular home that you would then want to follow up with HCD on. But you're right, if, if that's the way you want to verify it and the park owns 100 homes, yep, you're going to have to pay 25 bucks times 100. That's true. I just wouldn't, that wouldn't be the primary method I would use here. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll try again to see if Doris is available. Doris, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um... My microphone wasn't working. Um, the reason we got you now. <laughs> okay, the reason I was wanted to, uh, to find out what they own is to find out number one for the fifty percent, number two as far as eight sixty one. I want to find out what own homes he owns, and then find out if he's renting them or not. Well, you could always ask as well. You could always put it in writing and say. I'm going to just kindly ask you this question. And if they refuse to answer it, then you could always request a meeting with them. Um, I'd get as many other residents as I could, including yourself, to try to join in the request. But if they're going to try to hide information, then you know maybe that becomes an MRLPP issue for you to file a complaint on. Um, what jurisdiction are you in a rent you're in a you're in an RSO jurisdiction, right? In the city of Los Angeles, right? Yeah, well, I think the city should have information on that as well. The park should be reporting to the city what spaces they own because those would be exempt from the RSO. So I would go to the city. That should be public information. Would that be the assessor's office? No, that would be oh, the other oh, city. Okay. That would be the, the city manager, or if you have an ordinance that has a rent board or a rent administrator you would contact mm -hmm. the mobile home rent administrator because they should have an annual reporting that they have to provide as to how many spaces are under the ordinance because the city charges them a fee for the number of spaces that are covered by the ordinance. And they're gonna say, you know, these 10 spaces are exempt for whatever reason. I don't wanna be charged for those spaces. So I'd, I'd go with the city first. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. All right, Martha, back to you. Okay, uh, this question, I'm. there might be questions because I'm not sure what they're asking. So if the person is, is on the phone that asked this question, please raise your hand. Uh, the question reads, in an ROP, which has residual renters, which own their mobile homes, 
How is that situation impacted under AB 861? Well, I think the question is in a resident owned park where um, you have some people who have not participated in the purchase of the park and that they didn't have the money to buy in, if you will. So they're just renting from probably the nonprofit corporation. Um, it, how is that impacted under 861? Um, a resident owned park is not gonna be governed by the mobile home residency law unless it qualifies under that pursuant to 799.1. 799 is the part of the MRL that actually applies to um, resident owned parks. So it might be that 861 doesn't apply at all to the resident owned park. But I would certainly say that um, there's not in a resident owned park, there's still going to be even even if 861 does apply, we're not really talking about the spaces where it's a pure rental from the corporation. You know, we're talking about uh, somebody who's renting because again, they didn't have the funds to buy in. What we're talking about, it, that, that person still owns their home. It's not that the park owner owns the home. I really don't think that in any way 861 would impact that situation. Okay, thank you. Well, the next person is identified as Z999. Go ahead. Sounds like a secret agent. <laughs> Did they disappear? Um, they're not showing on my screen anymore. Okay. Okay. Well, they are, they are a secret agent. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go back to Martha. Okay. Scrolling through. Uh, and yes, I am taking them to the best of my ability and the order in which I receive them. Okay, the next question is, does the manager owner have the right to refuse residency to the purchase of a trailer and demand that the trailer be removed from the park? Well, I mean, this is a really broad question. I would, I would invite the person who asked the question to review two sections of your mobile home residency law, because it sounds like you're not aware of those sections. And those sections are 798.73, which we discussed on Mr. Drummond's question a little while ago, and 798.74. 798.74 does require management approval for a purchaser of a home. There are only two reasons that approval could be withheld, financial ability to pay rent, or the person who's seeking residency has prior evictions because they didn't follow rules and regulations in other tenancies. Almost always it's the financial component that is used to deny residency. That requires credit report, the person has to meet the credit score and an adequate income, typically three to one ratio. 798.73 prevents management from requiring the removal of a home on resale unless it is significantly run down or in disrepair and management bears the burden of that proof. So in almost every case that I've ever seen, management is very, very difficult for management to ever prove that a home must be removed on resale, very difficult. But these are broad questions. You really should review those two sections of the law. Okay. Uh, we've already had Dan once, so I'm going to go back to Martha and uh, she can go on with, uh, and, but maybe before we do that, Bruce, how long would you like to continue? Because it's I mean, I'll, three. I'll go till 1230. We can extend it out as long as you, the Zoom can continue till then. I don't, I don't mind if we have a lot of questions. Okay, Martha, go ahead. Okay, the city of Bell owns the two mobile home parks in the town and they want to sell them but they still don't know what to do. So my question is, how long do we, the homeowners, have to wait for them to decide to sell? And if not, how long do we need to wait to find out? Also, we could, can we sell our own homes during this waiting time? Yeah, I'm, I'm really having trouble understanding this question. You were saying that the city government owns a couple of the homes? 
and, Correct. and they want to sell them. And how long do they have to sell? I mean, I don't think there's any restriction on how long they have to sell. They could take 10 years if they wanted to, I guess. I mean, I don't think there's any law that says city can't own a home or a city has a certain time to sell a house. And I don't see how the city's ownership or proposed sale of their homes has any relationship to any other resident selling their house. So I, I, I'm not seeing the connection. There must be more. Um, Martha Vasquez could speak to that. Can Martha, can you maybe clarify? Because I don't think I'm understanding what's going on here. Yes, uh, the thing is uh, the city on the city of Al is owner that two mobile home purchases belong to the city. So they want to sell him, but they doesn't know how to do it right now. They they only know the pendings. On oh, that they're, so they're talking about selling the entire park. Yeah, that they want ah, to enter the okay. two the two mobile home parks. Okay, and so the question is, do they have some period of time to sell the park? And I would say, no, I don't think so, unless there's some other event, like you know, if they don't sell within a certain time, then the state's going to take it by eminent domain or something else is going on. But if the, and, and I think I understand the other part of the question is, can residents sell their homes while all this is pending? Right. Yes, that's correct. And the answer, of course, is yes, but there's undeniably going to be a potential problem selling your home if you have to disclose that this park is owned by the city and they're looking to sell it because that could mean that the buyer is going to close the park and redevelop it into another use. So anybody selling their home, I think they're going to have a duty to disclose this. It doesn't mean they can't sell, but it does mean there could be um, a negative effect. And in that sense, I guess I would say, um, maybe the city really needs to move on this because otherwise if people start having trouble selling their homes, they could say, you know, you're just keeping this hanging over our heads and it's impacting us financially. And um, maybe they'd even have a claim against the city at some point if it becomes unreasonable. Yes, exactly. So yeah, that, that mostly because I've received that many calls from mostly the residents. They started going because they don't know um, uh, what's going on. I know what I see. Uh, the city has a problem issue for the they was they doesn't know how uh, if you, they want to apply for subdivisions, and, and especially because they also they have like uh, RV um, mobile homes too. So that thing is. Um, the many of residents started calling me if you, they want to, if you, they can sell in the houses. And I say that's a very hard decision right now because that, is, that city doesn't, even they doesn't give you the, the right answer. They, they don't know what they're doing right now. They, they, list, they put it like all these residents like a holy. Yeah, well, it's a very unique question and I can't really answer it better than I did. I would just say legally, they certainly have the right to sell. The question is, if they try to sell and they have to tell their buyer, the city owns the park and they're looking to sell it, is that going to impact their ability to sell? Maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah, I, I think we might probably want to take this offline because I think yeah. it's a little more complicated. And yes, we want thank to, you. We thank want to you. give some, some more people a chance. Um, okay. Yes. OK, Martha, let's go back to you. Yeah, well, I one of the things I'm supposed to be doing, folks, just so you know, is I'm supposed to be um, watching who's already talked. So Anne Maria, she disappeared off the screen. She had her hand up. She has not talked yet. There she is. And MJ, I think that's Mary Jo. So they should be taken before these other people that have questions because they're doubling back. OK, Correct. let me go to my list. Uh, the city of LA wants to improve our electrical infrastructure, but the park owner will not cooperate slash communicate with the department. Is there any recourse to get the owner to work with the Los Angeles Department of WP, whatever that is? I mean, I don't know. I'd have to know a lot more about this, but the one comment I would make is there has been, and we have been significantly involved with it from the very beginning over the last decade with the CPUC, the Public Utilities Commission in San Francisco, hearings which have resulted in a program 
It's called basically the Utility Upgrade Program for Mobile Home Parks. It's now a permanent program. It was initially a four-year pilot. That program um, allows park owners to completely um, redo, upgrade, and reconstruct their gas and electric systems. And it's a program um, that's run with the serving utility and contractors. And the cost of to do so, we call this a line extension. The cost to do so is going to be borne by all of the ratepayers of the state of California, not the park owner, not the park residents in this park. So if a park owner has failing gas and electric infrastructure, it's certainly within their best interest to apply for this program and to get in line. We call it the queue, to get in the queue and have this done because there's pretty minimal cost to the park owner. They only have to pay for the part from the meter back to the home. That's the, 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 the meter to the home behind the meter, we call it, is the system portion that's owned by the park owner. Beyond the meter, from the meter to the street is the submetered system part that the park took over from the utility, but now they're gonna be giving it back to the utility. So the park will be out of the business of utility and the people in this park would be paying directly probably to Edison or to SoCal Gas for the utilities. So it's a program that they should become aware of and be involved with. If they refuse to do it, it's not a mandatory program, but I would just say, they're not going to upgrade. They're going to start becoming liable to their residents for failed gas and electric service. So I think somebody needs to maybe have a conversation with this park owner and tell them you're not understanding what you can take advantage of under the law. Okay, thank you. So let's go to Maria. There we go. Hello. Hi, good morning or good afternoon. Hi. Hi. I had a question. Um, is the manager at a park legally obligated to tell the seller or the agent when they receive all documents for potential buyer um, for approval or denial? Yeah, I know they have to, I'm sorry. I know they have 15 business days to let us know, but are they obligated to inform us when they received all documents for that approval or denial? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. Are you asking me, are they obligated to inform you at such point as the buyer has completed an application and submitted it? Yes. Well, I, I would say that, first of all, that should be known because the buyer or the buyer's agent's going to know when that happened, and you would start counting your 15 business days from that date. So I think you, you're going to know that anyway. There's no specific requirement in the law that says they have to issue a notice or something, but that's pretty well implied, right? Um, we are having, sorry about that, Bruce. We have, we are have, I am having a situation where the agent um, with the potential buyer has not told my agent when he submitted, nor the manager. She just given us a date of when she'll let us know when it's denied or approved. Yeah, well, if I, if I had an agent, I'd tell my agent, you need to, to ask the other agent and find out when the completed packet was submitted so that we know how to count off the 15 business days. And it would make no sense to me that the buyer's agent wouldn't want to disclose that. That did, I don't know why. Why on earth would they want to hide that? And we have asked that, and it's been going in circles. Should we go to the agent's manager and ask now? Yeah, this is now becoming a real estate transaction question, much more than a mobile home question. So yeah, I would say, I don't know if there's a, this is a salesperson with a managing dealer or a, a real estate agent with a managing broker, but I would either go to the broker or to the dealer above the agent's head to get that information. Or I would just ask the park manager. If the park manager is not going to disclose it. I did. I, did. I would say the buyer on the buyer's side, they've got to disclose it. It's in their interest to also be able to calculate that 15 business days. 
I did ask four times in an email. My agent did. I asked the manager in person and she was going in circles. Well, I would put a written request in writing through my agent to the other side. And I don't know how to answer that beyond that. Cause you know, again, I'm not a real estate attorney by trade where I'm doing transactions routinely. So there may be some other strings you could pull, but you know, at, I mean, at some point, everybody's got to know when was the application submitted? And at some point, most responsible park management companies or onsite managers are going to identify when they consider a completed application is in front of them because they're going to also want to have that calculation you know, known of the 15 business days. Now, again, if everybody's going to hide the ball, I don't know really what to tell you. I think you're going to have to just say, well, our assumption is that here's when it was submitted and we've counted 15 business days and we say you're in violation and then challenge them to say, oh, no, I'm not. It was only submitted on this date. You see what I'm saying? Okay. That's kind of, that'll smoke out the date. Yeah. Gotcha. I like that. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to have to challenge them. Okay. Martha, back to you. Yeah. A uh, housekeeping again, uh, and MJ Barr would be the next person. And then all the people that have their hands up, they've already had a question. So uh, I will be taking folks off my list who haven't had a bite of the apple yet. Okay. So this next question is, I don't trust that the park is charging the correct usage for my unit either because they are inflating the usage or because I'm being charged for usage outside my control. My question is, how can I confirm what I'm actually using and that I'm only being charged for my usage? I'm assuming that she's talking about electrical or water. I asked her that question, but she didn't respond. So the question stands as is. Yeah, I think we're talking about gas, electric, or water. <clears throat> the first way that you confirm that is you look at your meter readings. You know, um, you don't have to be much of an expert to be able to track uh, electric kilowatt hours on a meter. Um, not quite sure about gas therms, but also water, uh, it's cubic centimeter feet. So you should be able to, ch to check the CCF on the water by looking at the numbers on the dial or the electrical usage. And then you would wanna contact the serving utility, the water provider or the gas or electric provider. If you think that you're being overcharged, you wanna look at your bill. The bill should show the amount of um, kilowatt hours, gas therms or CCF units that they say you're expending that should have the charge per unit on there any other kind of service charges, anything, yeah, that should all be itemized. And if you think that's incorrect, contact your utility company, the gas or electric or the water provider. Make sure that the, the, if there's a tier charge, sometimes you know there's these tiers where when you use energy that goes over a certain amount, you, you transition to a higher tier and that has a different rate than a lower tier. Sometimes there's one, two, three tiers uh, in an area. But those are real technical questions that need to be answered by the utility provider. That's where I'd start. I'd try to read my own meters, but then I'd go to the utility provider. Okay, thank you. All right, Mary Jo, you're next. Oh, yes. Um, the, I'm going back to the one with uh, Martha Vesquez was talking about the city of Bell. Uh, those two parks are being looked into by David Loop and Dean Sargent. And David had uh, mentioned that he is looking at three different nonprofits to help partner with the homeowners to be able to purchase their parks, both parks from the city. Great. Oh, okay. Thank you. Martha, uh, back to you. Okay. Henry Cleveland. You'll be interested in this question. And by the way, Bill sent thanks to, to us. And uh, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta give a shout out to Henry because he's, he's been fabulous too. So he's behind the scenes making sure people are muted. So he deserves shout. big shout. thanks too. Shout, shout. <laughs> shout, shout. Okay, okay. Uh, 
in a room where the HOA board, I'm presuming she's sitting in the room right now, uh, in a room where the HOA board has failed in a resident owned park, has failed to have a timely election and allowed terms of office to expire and have terms that are active and residents are forced to seek information and guidance because of a lack of transparency. Can the non expired board members be censored from performing elected duties, which is confusing. Yeah, I, I may know which part this is. Um, I, I probably do. And it's a lot more of a corporations question than a mobile home question. So I'm just going to very simply say, I don't literally know without researching it, but I seriously doubt it. And if this is the same park, I'm told that not only have board members been censored, but they are being excluded from all board communications. They're being excluded from board meetings. My personal opinion is all of it is flatly illegal and being censored means absolutely nothing. A censor is just a sort of a formal slap on the hand. Um, it's a damage to one's reputation uh, by its intention, but it really means nothing. So that, that's my simple response to that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, FYI, Anne, you, you can take two, two people because uh, I'm, I'm still struggling with the chat. I don't think I have any more questions that, have, that haven't already had a bite of the apple. So give me a chance to uh, get the chat in line. Thanks. Okay. Very good. So we'll go to Todd and then after Todd will be Jackie. Yeah, we can do repeat offenders now. <laughs> uh, I'm a repeater. Th thank you, Bruce and all. Um, could you hear me, I hope? We hear you. Okay, this is a follow up on an earlier thing. Uh, in, we, we've been in the park. Well, the park has, the homes have been in the park since 1992. We've had them for five years and they're prime lakefront. And uh, the park owner wants to, wants to sell us wants us to sell them the home when we don't even want to sell the home. And the, the long term, the five year lease is up uh, next year. And he said he wants he will take the space if we don't sell them and we don't want to sell. Now, must he renew the lease or not? He's the same guy that's charging uh, two hundred and fifty dollars to get a permit to sublet. This is the yeah. same part. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me because this is illegal all of this, everything you're telling me is flatly illegal and unenforceable. I mean, I've already answered this. Let me try to resummarize. First of all, you don't have, you don't need any kind of lease agreement to continue to live in the park. Let's go back to the very beginning of the call today. Once you're a homeowner, you sign the initial agreement to move into the park. When that agreement expires, you can sign a new one if you want, but why do that? You don't have to. You never have to sign anything else. You become automatically a month to month tenant. You can never be evicted unless one of the seven reasons that I went through. Okay. So there's no need to sign anything new. If, if you're literally wanting me to again, address the issue of can a park owner make us sell our home to him? How, on how many levels does that sound wrong? No, that's not right. To totally. I'm more, the anxiety comes with him threatening, saying, if you don't sell, we will not renew the lease. And that's but you don't, where- but, but there's no lease that needs to be renewed, Todd. In other words, that threat is premised upon you being ignorant of the mobile home residency law. That threat is premised upon the notion that under California law, when a lease expires, you lose your tenancy and you have to leave the park. That's not the law. Right. Because we're in Riverside County. It doesn't um, matter where you are. The right. state law throughout the state of California says that there's only seven reasons you could be terminated and the expiration of a lease is not one of them. You, you don't need any lease or written rental agreement beyond your initial one when you moved in and bought your home to continue to live there. As long as you pay rent, don't break rules, don't substantially know neighbors, commit crimes or have code violations. You get to stay there as long as you want. Right. And if he says, when your lease is over, I'm gonna terminate it. I'd say, uh, can you please point to the law that allows you to do that? Because you know I'm not finding any such law. Yeah, because he's saying it's an older, 
an older home and it's considered an RV in his, like they, every lease that they sign with everybody in the park is RV when it's been there since 1992. There is no law that says, and we're, we're, and we're going into all kinds of different permutations here right. in the last few minutes, but there is no law that says, it, I mean, first of all, whether it's an RV or a mobile home, that's definitional, okay? Um, we can determine that according to the legal definitions of those terms. But there's no law that says if you're on a lease and you're in an RV, let's assume you're and, you're and your lease expires, I get to evict you from the park. RVs, once they are in place for nine or more consecutive months, are considered mobile homes for all purposes of the mobile home residency law, except one. And I'm referring now to the very front of the MRL 798.3. You need to review that. The only exception is if you want to sell and you're in an RV, he can tell you, you have to move the RV as a condition of sale because it's not a mobile home. So that's a significant fact I didn't know till just now. If you're in an RV and it's not a mobile home, it doesn't meet the definition by its width or length or area, then you may not be able to sell in place. But otherwise, if you, if you don't want to sell and you're just saying, I just want to keep living here, he can't force you out. There's no way. Oh, that no, that's perfect. And then, and then with that rental permit thing, he's that's totally illegal, like you said. Yes, because he wants people to. Let's say he wants us to not be able to lease, and then take the. You know, we lease. He says, "Oh, you didn't pay the permit. Now we're going to take your space." Well, I've answered the question. There's okay. No, so, thank you. The Le legally, what illegal. direction could I go in? Could you point me like? like where I could find more information legally? Uh, about what? Well, like if I needed to get a lawyer or something to deal with this. It's like the mobile home residency law. I mean, if, you, if you're asking about how to find a lawyer. Yeah. Well, I mean, beyond myself, you just want to go find any lawyer that would be proficient in your area. And if you, other than looking online, um, contact your county bar association. All counties have what's called a lawyer referral service. Right. But I would just say, I'm not sure why you need a lawyer. I mean, unless you get notices saying, you know, I'm evicting you out of here, or you get a notice saying you have to pay a permit charge yeah. and he's going to try to charge you and actually like, I don't know what, evict you over that or take you to court. I don't even think you need a lawyer other than to say like, none of this is legal. I'm just not even pay attention to you. And if you're going to try anything, put it in writing. I dare you. Then, okay. Then, uh, house, then housekeeping inter interruption, Thank you. which is which is something yep. that we said we were going to do. Good. I'm glad he stopped talking because there's people who haven't had a chance yet, and he's asked a lot well, of we questions. We only have three minutes. It's, okay. I'm, I'm uh, Anne, not, Anne, would you please take Would me, you please so. take Jackie Jones, who's been uh -huh. very patient and is next? Yes. Go ahead, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I just want clarification on the answer you gave 15 business days to approve or deny a purchaser. What is that pursuant? What is that pursuant to Bruce? 798.74 subsection A. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Okay, um, I think that probably if there are still other chats that we haven't actually covered, that what I would like to do, if and Martha, if you agree with this, is to compile them in, uh, in a way that we can send them to Bruce and have him look at them, and then we can work with, with the various GSMO leaders to get these answers back to the people who made those questions. Yeah, I think that would be good because two and a half hours gets to most people's limit, including mine to talk. And by the way, I want to correct the answer I just gave was the section, subsection was incorrect for Jackie. It's actually 798.74 subsection B2. This, the subsections were renumbered in the last amendment. So it's 798.74 B2. But yeah, I'm, I had an hour uh, meeting at 8.30 and after another two and a half, I'm running out of steam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so just to let you know, the Ed Fund is at edfundacademy.blogspot.com, edfundacademy.blogspot.com. In case you want to uh, keep an eye on that website, we will let you know when we're ready to post the video. Um, 
and and just go there and have a look at what we do. And and I wouldn't I'd be remiss if I didn't also beat the drum for GSMOL. Remember that your membership dollars help all of the good folks that are out there helping folks to deal with these issues. So again, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Martha. Great questions, Henry. everybody. Great questions. And thank you, Martha and Henry, for your good work today. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Have a good thank day. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Jason. You guys, too. Thank you.